What we're going to cover today is a very, very brief review of part one, which was the seven myths that got this whole thing started, and then a also brief review of part two where we introduced Delta E and covered actually in more detail than we'll cover in this presentation. And today we're going to talk more about the LED color space. Uh, and that's going to begin with a history of what we call the CIE 1931 XYZ color space. Uh, and explain how that relates to LAB and show you that visually. We'll discuss the reason that there are multiple Delta E formulas. You may have heard of them before, CMC, CIE, 2000, CIE, LAB. Those are all Delta E formulas and can be confusing. It's like an alphabet soup. Which one do you need? We'll then take the live measurements of spot colors, like I said, so you can see how, how these results actually look when you take measurements. And as always, we'll leave time for questions and answers. So we always like to start these with a illustration of why color measurement is important. It's not because our eyes are bad at seeing color. They're actually very good at being, seeing color. Unfortunately, they're very easily fooled. So we're, gonna, we're gonna bring up a poll question here before we give you the answer. So, how many different color oranges do you see? Did it? There we go, okay. So we'll give you, oh, I have to launch, I don't think I launched it yet. So yes, attendees, we will be launching a poll. You can there actually okay. select it Sorry on your screen. That. So now you should actually have a, a poll that you can fill in. And we will give you few more seconds to answer. It looks like, let's see. Okay, looks like all of those who are going to vote have voted. So we will close the poll. Let's look at those results real quick. Okay. And then share the results. Okay. So as you can see, um, Julie, is, is the result showing? I, yes, it is. Okay, yep. okay. <laughs> thank you. Sure. I've got it on one screen and my presentation on the other. So, uh, so basically, we have about 25% uh, of you thought that's three different oranges, and 18% thought it was two. And I'm kind of glad that 57% of you have either seen this before or we weren't able to fool you. Um, those of you who were quote unquote fooled, it's 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 really not uncommon. What we've done is we've put different surround colors behind these and we put them far enough apart that you can't do a really quick side-by-side -side comparison. So this is why color measurement is good because it, it would we could have measured all three and known that they were the same. So this is the graphic that we started oh, out. I have to hide the results. Oops, hold on. There we go. There you should be seeing it now, sorry. This is the graphic that we started out part one of our color control myths and mysteries webinar series with. Um, we have seven different myths here. Some of them included their swatch book colors are easily produced or your printer will always match the proof or you can, you can always trust your eyes, which we just showed you, you can't always trust your eyes. Oh. I'm not sure why we're having these problems. Okay. So in part two, which we did about a month ago, we talked about color perception. We had more visual uh, tools like we started with. And we talked about the biology of the human eye, which is that's an important piece to go back and look at because it does tie into how they came up with the CIE color space we're going to talk about. We talked about the differences between RGB and CMYK, which is, again, mainly the difference between the, the monitors you look at and the printed samples you look at. We introduced you to the concept of LAB, which is, again, a mathematical way to look at color. And we talked about how spectrophotometers do the best job they can to mimic the human eye. And then we gave, a, a, I think, a pretty detailed description visually of what delta E looks like. So let's jump right into this 1931 CIE XYZ color space. You can see by the, the graph on the screen that what they did is they took color, they took the rainbow, and they broke it down into a, a graph. And once it's a graph, you can, you can model it mathematically. And could just jump into some of the explanations. So it was really the first mathematical defined color, mathematically defined color space. And it was achieved by doing actually viewing experiments with human beings. So they they created a controlled viewing environment. Uh, this is a slide from part two with a light source. 
and objects that were viewed at a very specific angle. And then the reason that that, that angle is so important, so let's jump back into the biology of the human eye again. The human eye has what, rods and cones, and the cones see color. But the greatest concentration of cones is in an area called the fulvia, which you can see from this slide is a very, very small area. And it represents about 2% of uh, your retina. So it's important that when you do a color viewing experiment, you be looking straight on at the colors within two degrees of error. Since they've done some 10, 10 degree experiments, but many people still refer back to this original study. So what, that, what they were able to do by having all of these different human beings look at these colors that were both projected, so RGB, and then just displayed, printed samples, they were able to physically map, mathematically, what those colors looked like. And that, that created what we call the 1931 standard observer. Now, I really don't want to oversimplify this, but I sort of have to. You, you could, there's a whole Wikipedia article on this. There's books written on this. So it, we're really just trying to hit this at a very, very high level so you have some understanding of how this CIE color, CIE color space, which is kind of a funny shape, but it's, yeah, there's actually color names on there if you can see them. But this is, this is really the raw map. This is the XYZ that really only means anything to real, real color scientists. So what happened was it was determined that they needed a more usable color space. So they mathematically derived from XYZ to something we call LAB. And I'll let the designer talk about that. Well, and that's just it. I, while that's very interesting, it's fun to take these color theory history lessons, I don't really care as a graphic designer. I want to know how I can fix my color, how I can get it to look how I want it to look. So this is what we kind of call an LAB cheat sheet. And you have to think about color in a three-dimensional space. And this isn't our theory or idea, but try to visualize a basketball. At the top of the basketball where you say L equals 100, that would be your lightest point. At the bottom of the basketball, L equals 0, that's your darkest. That's where your most concentrated blacks would be. If you see along the green and red axis, negative A plus A, and the blue and orange axis, plus B would be more orange, negative B would be more blue. And so that's, that's the center of the basketball where, where we have those kind of cubes displayed or rectangles, squares. Um, and of course, as you get closer to the top of the basketball, that it narrows in to the point where you're white, and then at the bottom, it narrows into the point where you're black. So at the middle of the basketball, you have your most saturated primaries and secondaries. Um, were we supposed to ask a poll question? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were. So, so that's so we, we're still being theoretical until this slide. This is where kind of the rubber meets the road. We have two images here, and I want to actually thank X-Rite. They have a, a great printed book called The Guide to Understanding Color Communication. That's it may be out of print physically, but I was able to find a, a PDF version of it online. It's worth googling for and finding because it's got that's where a lot of these images come from in this next section. So we've got these two roses, a, a yellow rose and a red rose. And what I've done, or what they've done, is they've shown you the LAB values below each one of those. So you can see if you just look at those numerically, those, you know, we have an L of 52 versus an L of 29. Those, those are very different. So they, they have a very different lightness at, in an A of um, 8 versus an A of 52. So they have a very different uh, along the, the axis, which is green to red, they have a very different value. And then they, have, they also have a very different B value, which is along that orange to blue axis. So obviously we can visually see that these are different, but what's interesting is to then see how they plot out. So I've actually done something here to sort of fool your eyes. The yellow rose is point A, which I've circled in red, so it stands out. And the red rose is the letter B, which I've circled in yellow. Um, and you can clearly see when you put a backdrop behind the numbers that sure, the yellow rose is, is not only yellow, but it's very close to the outside of the basketball. So that's, and that's where the most saturated colors are. And the red rose is also very close to the outside of the basketball. 
and again, where, where you have a saturated color. So this is where we start to see the practical application of all the math, is that, yes, the math can see color differences just like our eye can see color differences. Now that only, that, that example we just saw, that only showed us the, the distance in and out from the center of the basketball, really, and around the outside edge. What about if we just focus in on the yellow rose and we look at two different spots within that yellow rose? So you can see there's two different L values here, an L of 53 on the left side and an L of 64 on the right side. Now, just to see if you guys have been paying attention, based only upon the L value, Make sure I can read this to you. Can't see it. Based only upon the L values uh, displayed, which one of the yellow roses? And I'm going to undisplay this for a second. I will bring it back up. Based upon the L star value, which of these roses is darker? Okay, I'm going to reopen that poll for you. I apologize. Oh, I guess I can't reopen it. Darn. All right. So. 60% of you said it was the one on the left, and 40% said it was the one on the right. So darker would be an L of 0, and 53 is, in fact, less than 64. So the one on the left is darker. So those the 60% of you got that right. So let's look again at the... LAB chart, and you can see and a lower a lower L value takes you closer to the bottom of the basketball where things are dark or darker. In part two of this webinar, we spent a lot of time talking about delta E, which is total color difference. But here is how it breaks down with LAB. A delta L, as we showed you in the our cheat sheet chart there, is the lightness to darkness. Delta A is your difference between red and green, with plus being redder and minus being greener. And then delta B is the difference on the, that yellow-blue axis, with plus being yellower. I don't like that word, yellower. <laughs> or minus being road. bluer. <laughs> and when you, but when you put that all together, that's how you get your delta E. It's the total color difference. So that's the words, for those of you who think more visually like I do. So when we, when we start... When we talk about the original delta E formula, which is now referred to as CIELAB or CLAB, it, it's a cube. So remember, though, the color space is a basketball. So the color space is a sphere, yet we're describing color difference with a cube. So hopefully those of you who have you know, any, any geometry realize that, that they started out with a problem. They were trying to they have a, 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 basically a spherical or elliptical space or model to define color, that we're just finding differences in color within that space as a cube. And as a result, it ended up only being about 75% accurate, whoops, based on a comparison to the human eye. And it's, it's because of the, the sharp corners inside of something that doesn't have sharp corners. So the next thing they, you know, as, as we progressed on in the, in the probably uh, 60s and 70s, they came up with another mathematical formula, or another mathematical representation of color, and this time they called it L star, C star, H star, and that had an elliptical tolerancy method. Now, just to understand how LCH relates to LAB, it's actually, you can plot in the exact same space the two numbers, but because of the difference in the way that they're derived, they can actually create a different tolerancy method. So L is exactly the same. It goes from the bottom of the basketball to the top of the basketball. The difference is that instead of having an A and a B, we, just, we have a, a C, which stands for chroma, or really the intensity of that color. And that goes from the center of the circle out to the edges. And you can see they're actually plotting. Uh, if we looked at the A, they went from the center out to the letter A up at the top. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the other thing you do is you plot the Q, which is, in the case of our yellow and red rows, there's, they have a difference in hue, so that they're, they're saturated. They have almost the same chroma, but they have a different color or hue. And that's plotted starting at what we know as the A side, A plus A, 
it goes all the way around the circle, so it's 360 degrees, so it's essentially what they call a polar plotting method. Again, you don't necessarily need to know how it plots, but it does help to understand where the colors end up and how they end up there. What's more important is that that's the reason that many people have moved to both the CMC and now the CIE 2000 tolerance method of delta E. It's because instead of that, that cube, we now have an elliptical tolerancy method, which is much more reflective of the way the human eye works. And the original elliptical tolerancy method uh, was CMC, and, and that basically related about 85% to, to the human eye as far as accuracy and discerning colors, mathematically versus visually. And then the more recent, CIE 2000, is about 95% representative of human vision. So it's, it, they're, they're getting very, very close to matching the human eye. So getting back to our basketball, let's pretend that I'm looking down at the top of the basketball. And we still have, you can still see the green, red axis, you can still see the yellow, blue. But now we've added in all these different ellipses. But if you look closely, you'll see that they're not all the same size, even as you go in from the larger ones out on the outside of the basketball down to the center of the basketball. And that's because humans just don't see colors all the same. If you look at the green, for instance, look at the green area on the left there, look how big those circles are in comparison to the orange. And they're more, yeah, so they're more tightly packed, too, up in the orange region. And that's because our eyes see orange more, I don't know if the word is more accurately, but we can discern more oranges than greens. So just as a little synopsis, I guess, of these delta E's. So they started out with the C-Lab delta E, and they discovered that was about 75% accurate compared to the human eye. CMC 2 to 1 delta E, 85 to 90, but now... CIE 2000, we're at 90 to 95% accurate. Great. So, we have a poll question. We have a poll question. Oh, okay, perfect. So our next poll question is, which Delta E method do you use in your daily operations? So we will give you guys a chance to answer that. Unlike last time? Yeah, this time I won't stop them. <laughs> Give you guys just a few more seconds to answer because it looks like you're slowing down your answer rate. All right, three, two, one, and the poll is closed. So let's share our results. I need to look at this. One. Okay. Oops. I find these re I need to share. I'm having a technical problem. There we go. I find these results rather interesting, uh, in encouraging in many ways. It looks like about 37, about 40 percent of you were able to answer, which is which is excellent. That means that you're actually you have instruments and you're taking measurements. Uh, as far as don't know, that means you're probably taking measurements. So we really have you know close to 60, 65 percent of you that are at least taking measurements, and then 40 percent of you who who haven't measured yet. So that's great because we're going to show you in this next section pretty soon how to actually take measurements. Right, so let's talk about these delta E formulas. Really, this is a slide that I quite honestly picked up from a presentation I did in Las Vegas almost 10 years ago. And nothing has changed except my the last bullet point. It's most important that you pick one delta E formula and you stick with it. It's important that you compare apples to apples. So if you're going to decide that in-house we're, we're going to use C-Lab or we've been using C-Lab, until you have a very compelling reason to not use C-Lab, you should stick with it. Now, you might have, one of those compelling reasons might be that your customer says, if you want to print for me, and it's a large major brand and you want to print for them, then you have to hit these LAB values within a CIE delta E of this. Well, there's a very compelling reason to use CIE 2000, for example. And, and that's, in the printing and graphic arts industry, there's a very strong and, and prevalent move towards CIE 2000. So if you're just starting out, that's probably not a bad place to start. So now we're going to have a little bit of fun here and actually take some measurements. What you see on the screen, each circle there, the top one is a certain T box that we can't name. 
And then the second circle down there, that's the yellow on the T pouch that we can't name. And then this is the yellow off of the swatch book. And we're going to try to see how they measure up to each other. But before we do, these are the actual samples that we're going to measure. With all the knowledge that you just learned about delta E, how big of a delta E difference do you think there is between that the swatch book and not just one, and really between all three of these samples, if we take the, if we call the swatch book the standard and take either the tea bag or the tea box, how far apart are the, how, how large a delta E difference do you think we have? So let me launch that poll for you. And we're being nice. I feel like this is Jeopardy. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, what was funny was when we did this poll question, we didn't know the answer. Right. When I wrote, I hadn't taken the measurements yet. I just knew what I was going to measure. And I'm pretty sure I guessed right. I should have actually, I should have made myself guess and written it down. All right. It looks like based on our last poll question, most of you have answered that are going to answer. So we'll give you about five, four, three two, one, and we'll close the poll and share the results. Now this one I'm not going to tell you the answer yet, um, so just kind of look at it and realize that what, about half of you think it's between five and ten, so that's the, and really if, well, thinking about statistics this is perfect too, mm -hmm. um, and about 20 percent think it's less than five and 25 think it's more and seven of you aren't sure, so that's great. So thank you very much for participating in the poll questions, I think they make these presentations a little more exciting. All right, give me one moment here while I switch over. So the tool we're going to use to measure today is a piece of software that we've created at Color Metrics, and it's called ProofPass. And I'm not going to go too much into the technology of the software today. That's we're going to cover it in much greater detail in part four, because in part four we're going to talk about color process control, which is very important. But we'll leave that until I've done a little bit of a demo. Um, ProofPass has two components. There's what we call the wizard, or some people call it a client application. And the client application is where we actually take measurements. So I've already set up something we call a data set, and we've got this one called T Company Yellow. And I'm going to then click Next in the application. It shows me that I'm supposed to be measuring something that looks yellow, like this. And I've done some measurements earlier today, but we'll just take some duplicate measurements now. So the first one I'm going to measure is my swatch book. And we're using an I1 to do this, by the way. Yeah, why don't you give them a play-by-play, -play, Shelby? Right now, Jim is using the I1 to measure the yellow on the swatch book. If you've used an I1, you know, it doesn't take very long. And you can see there that we have a status of pass. So there's, and there's a couple things. I, did, I took some time and I, um, I filled in what we call metadata. And this is, again, something we'll cover in more detail in part three for those of you that are interested. But I actually just measured the Pantone book. So I should tell it that I measured a Pantone book versus something else. And my customer is a tea company and I have a job number. So this is, these are things that we can configure ourselves. Now, I, I, normally I would click Next at this point and transmit these results to our web server. Just because I've done enough live demos, I've already sent all the data up to the web server. But I can grab the tea bag that I measured earlier. I can measure that again for you guys. So going through the same process, we have the tea envelope, I guess, and not really the tea bag, but we've taken that out. and So in this case, notice yep. we've got a fail. And again, you know, if we were going to we were going to transmit these results, we probably want to say, Shelby's right. And <laughs> well, if you actually measured the tea bag, it really would fail. <laughs> it would, you're right. Um, twist it up here. So in that case, we did get a fail, and we'll We'll go to the web server and show you how big these differences are in a moment. The, the key with our software is that we try to make the user interface very, very easy. Now let's measure the box. <laughs> I 
Go ahead, tell me what just happened. Well, there are now about 50 tea envelopes on the floor <laughs> because he tried, he's tried to keep them in there but while he was measuring the lid of the box. Get those out of the way. <laughs> Guess we'll be cleaning that up. All right. So in this case, we've got a pass. And the pass fail is based upon the fact that we have values inside of proof pass. So let's go back to the web server side. So ProofPass, as I said, is two pieces. It's ProofPass.com, and, and then it's the ProofPass wizard, which you just saw. So now that, let's look at the .com side. So when we go to our recent activity page within ProofPass, we can see the, the measurements we've made. And I created this installation just for this demo. So I have the Pantone book against the T-Box, the Pantone book against the T-Bag envelope, the Pantone book measured against itself, and then the pan, my original, what I call baseline measurement. So let's look at the most recent one, the box. And there's a whole bunch of numeric information. Again, these kinds of things we will cover in much greater detail in the next, next demonstration. But look over here. We've got that CIE 2000 formula. And there's the CMC. So I show you all three formulas. And what's interesting is with C-Lab, we got a 5, delta E of 5, between the... Um, which one is this again? This is the key box. We got a 5 with CMC a 163 and with CIE 2000 a 2. 2 is a very good number. I'll explain that in a moment. So here again, here's, here's the Pantone book. Here's measuring the Pantone book again with the same instrument. So this just allows for the fact that no two measurements are exactly the same with the same instrument. You might want to point out though that aren't both of those in different environments? Nope, oh, these were both, both here, both here okay. today. All right. mm -hmm. And then this is the T envelope. So the T envelope had the highest delta E around five and a half. And then this is our T box. So let's continue on here. So this again is our T box. So it shows us on the left hand side a, a representation of what the, the Pantone book looked like. On the right side, what the box looked like. And then and you can see there's there is a visual difference, but in this case, whoever it was, the client gave us a delta E tolerance of 3.0, and we're only at 2.8. Now remember all those, all those numbers we talked about before. I can even give you a little cheat sheet so you can see it more clearly. That so, should look familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so our reference L is 86, and our measured L is 83. What's interesting is our A is almost identical, 344 to 366. Our B, however, is 97 versus 93. So as we look at those values and we look back at our LAB cheat sheet, we can see which direction it's going. So between 86 and 83, what happened? It got lighter, right? Or I'm sorry, it got darker. No, lighter. Right. We, went, we went along up along the axis, so it got lighter. That's why I have a cheat sheet, because even if you do this stuff every day, you get confused. And then the A went from a 344. That's, that's virtually the same. The B, though, went from a 97 to a 93, so that's a negative change along the B, so it got a little bit more blue. And sure enough, if you look over here at the visual rep or even over here, look at the visual representation, it just it looks a little bit cooler. I, was, I hate using subjective terms, but when they're backed up with numbers, I think they're more meaningful. And for those of you really into spectrophotometry, this is the spectral reflectance curve. Um, we won't cover that at all in these three, <laughs> in these four webinars. It gets... No. It gets unnecessary, and it's very, very uh, theoretical. So, so that's that's how you actually. Do, I want to show you one more. Let's find the go back to my home screen. I want to find the T, the book, or the envelope. There it is. So if we go to the envelope and we go back to that same swatches page, you can see here we have a, a very large delta E. Well, it's 5.6, and remember our client was only allowing us with a three. So let's see why that one failed what was different. And I can also tell you it's, it's kind of unfair. That's, that's an uncoded sheet versus a coded Pantone book and a coded box. So it's much more likely that that box is going to get within a 3 delta E than the, than the actual uh, tea bag. I'm kind of impressed they're this close. So in this case, the difference, they kept actually the L pretty good from 86 to 84. But they had a real problem with the A. Their A went from a 344, so that's kind of the red side. Of, of neutral and went over to the green side 
and, and that's that's a, and you're looking there at a net difference of about seven or eight delta units. That that's big. That's very big. Um, and then in the B, they went from a 97 to 82. So again, they went um, 97 would be almost a fully saturated kind of orangish to um, a you know back towards blue. So the same kind of problem that they had on the box, but com compounded with the fact that they went from red to green at the same time. And you can you can see that difference. It went from a really nice kind of warm uh, yellow to a, a very cool green yellow. So again, it, it's interesting that the numbers back up what we're visually seeing, and that's that was really the purpose of this webinar is to make sure that you you trusted the numbers that you were getting from an instrument versus those that, that you get from your own eye. So Jim, what is the answer to the poll question? Oh, the answer to the poll question is between 5 and 10. Because obviously this is, this is our worst example at 5.63. So between the Pantone book and the uh, T envelope, we had a 5.63. And half of those who answered got that right. Correct. Which is really good considering we have monitors involved and all kinds of things. <laughs> All right, so let's pop our PowerPoint back open. And so, Jim, we did get a question, and I think we covered it. I just want to make sure um, we did cover it thoroughly. So the question was, is the pass or fail based on preset tolerances? Do you set those tolerances, or how is that controlled? Um, it is, it's a preset tolerance that is user-definable. In the proof pass system, it's user-definable. So if your client said, I want you to print Pantone 109 within 3 delta E, and that's, that's the example I just showed. You would configure our software or other people's software to match a Pantone 109, which you can get digital versions of that. You can measure a book like I did. But what's important is that you start with a reference point, and then you create a tolerance, which we express in delta E. So delta E is the tolerance, and it is user-definable. I think that answers it for him, Julie? Yes, definitely. Okay, great. We've got a couple more slides to get through. So as far as takeaways, um, we wanted to make sure that, and this is kind of to help you pick questions. This is kind of to help you frame your questions, which we're going to have plenty of time for, it looks like. So we want to make sure that you, you leave with at least a basic understanding of what, what LABR and LCH and, and why, why both exist. Um, that there are, in fact, multiple delta E tolerances and how to pick the right one. And then the value of measuring combined with the visual assessment of color, which hopefully we just demonstrate all of those things to you. So next up, well, you can review this seminar soon and the first two, much like you can at Roland, uh, at colormetrics.com slash color myths. We have already scheduled part four, which Jim mentioned is going to be more about color process control or color management for July 17th. And I guess we're into the Q&A portion now. Yes. Well, let me, on the, the 10 part four, just to expand a little on what part four is going to do. Part four is going to talk about something called process control, which many of you may have heard of. It's, it's pretty popular in the manufacturing world. And that's, that's kind of the introductory portion. And then we're going to try and spend a good portion of the entire webinar showing you how to not only do more spot color measurements, but also to put in part two, we talked about uh, color bars, process control bars that you can put on each print or on a daily basis. We're going to show you how to put those on your prints, how to measure those, and how to use the results of those measurements to predict how accurate your, your spot color measure, uh, matching is going to be. So now is a good time to open up the questions. So we did have a question that came in that said the LAB uh, spot color 3D chart below has LABC H table shows plus B as orange instead of yellow. Why? I'm not sure if I read that correctly. <laughs> We're looking I, at it. <laughs> Shelby, yeah, if you can take a look at that question. Um, oh. Go back to the chart if you can. Hmm. Um, I guess that's one where I'd have, to, I'd have to do some research as to, from, I think yellow's in the right spot, so I, I think it's just basically whoever created this chart 
um, I, I can't remember the source of this chart. Might just have the, the squares a little bit off, quite honestly. But it's it's a, this is all all these visual representations are approximation approximation of what the map is doing. So I can definitely check on that. What is an I one? Uh, wow! In this presentation, we don't have a picture of one, do we? Uh, Julie, okay. do, you, do you want to jump in? Do you have your your web page ready right now, or no? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I will just go ahead and make myself the presenter and show my screen to everyone. So um, an I1 is a spectrophotometer. It measures colors. We actually sell the, Roland sells the x right I1. And I can go ahead and type in to our store here. Um, so we offer two different packages. And the basic Pro 2 package includes the spectrophotometer, which will help you linearize your printer as well as measure colors. However, if you want to go one step further and create custom profiles for media, you would be looking at the X-Rite i1 Publish Pro 2. So that includes the i prof or i1 profiler software where you can actually create custom, custom profiles. And we have a ton of webinar resources about linearizing printers as well as creating profiles. So that's in our webinar archive if anyone is interested in, in how to do that. And you can always call our customer service department regarding the I1 um, spectrophotometer. There's definitely other spectrophotometers out there. Um, we've just, we've got a long-standing relationship with X-Rite. We, per, you know, in-house we use the, the I1 spectrophotometer from X-Rite. So, um, so if you are looking at a spectrophotometer, you know, make sure to do some research, see what's out there, and um, make sure you get the proper training on it. But if you're at least thinking about it, you're in the right, you know, you're going in the right direction towards color management. Looks like we still have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, do the ellipses. As far as it looks like somebody did in fact confirm, and plus B is yellow, but again, it's if you look at the charts, it's it's kind of between a yellow and an orange. I mean, it is it's not a pure yellow even if you look at one of the X-ray charts. So it, it, whoever made the other the LAB chart versus some of the other charts we showed just didn't get it perfectly exactly accurate. It really is just more of a visual representation. So. Do the ellipses on the basketball color space represent the spot ranges of colors in that realm that are distinguishable by the human eye? And if so, what? I, well, to some extent they have to. I mean, Sorry, Jim, fact, can you, can you uh, say, repeat the question so everyone can yeah. Do the ellipses on the basketball color space slide represent the spot ranges of color in that realm that are distinguishable by the human eye? And if so, what delta E is used for the ellipses? Well, first of all, since they're ellipses, it would have to either be CMC or CIE 2000. And it's that's from the x right book. So if I had that book handy, I could actually look it up. But it's one of the two ellipticals. And they probably just picked a, a random delta E. I don't know, or tolerance. It could be two, it could be three, it could be five. But it's more important, as you pointed out in your question, that, it, that it's representative of how much tolerance the eye has, how much relative tolerance the eye has for color difference in that realm of the color space, exactly. Great, thank you. I think that might be all our questions. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the webinar. And as Jim mentioned, we do have part four coming on July 17th. So be sure to sign up for that when that is um, posted. We definitely encourage you to um, attend that last part of the series to fully benefit from um, all these, all this good information on color color management, and so this this webinar is being recorded. If you came in late or had to step away, it is it will be posted on the webinar archive of the Roland DGA site. And again, thank you for your time. I know it's it's hard to uh, 
sit down for an hour and focus on um, one thing. Sometimes I, I know we're all multitaskers. So thank you again. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.